So we've the, we've released Boreal Blizzard will come out next year. I had uh, was talking to someone in the Maritimes. They were buying some other variety from somewhere else. And since it's recording, I'm not going to say who. But uh, <laughs> uh, the name had implied that it was a huge berry. So I looked it up on the internet and I went, this is smaller than the average advanced selection in our breeding program. We, we collected like 130 advanced selections that year, and it was smaller than the average one, and they said they were planning it so big. So I looked at what are our biggest HASCAP. Number one biggest didn't taste fun, or at least Ellen, who does our lab analysis, she didn't like the flavor. I thought it was okay, but, so Ellen doesn't like it, we're not gonna do it, she's not gonna propagate it properly, right? <laughs> the next one was a, a variety I nicknamed Mega Wimp, because it had really big berries, but the berries were so heavy it weighted the branches down and they were creeping around on the ground. Like it couldn't stand up from the weight. So that's no good. Boreal Blizzard was the next biggest one. So I think it's the world's largest has cap. It had, the largest berry was 3.9 grams and that was after a bunch of growers got to the bush and ate a bunch. Uh, the average was 2.8. So it's pretty much three times the size of our first test of Russian varieties. It ripens in mid-July, a little later than the others. Tastes great. Uh, because it's so heavy, uh, it didn't, uh, uh, I just noticed the name of the oh, over there. <laughs> anyway, uh, it probably needs to be picked. It seemed like it tasted good for two weeks and then the berries started dropping. So it's gonna have less of a harvest window because it's so heavy. Now this reminds me of my trip back to Japan where I had uh, t gone to uh, a wholesale fruits auction and they had paid someone to go through all these Haskat berries and pull out the largest berries and sell them in these two flats. Of course in Japan they're really crazy about the ultimate giant this and that. I, they were told me these two flats will sell for as much as these flats. And there's my picture of their berry. In the, they actually gave me, like, it's probably worth like 70 bucks or something. You know, I asked for the, the tour guide gave me one of these, so I photographed it. There's their giant berries. Well, there's Blizzard. Like, so if there ever is going to be a fresh market grown anywhere in the world and shipped to Japan, it's probably going to happen here, and you just fly it over there really quick, right? Maybe you, make, maybe you can make a special container that's only as wide as the berry. <laughs> but anyway, it, I, you know, that could be like a really fun thing, but we need more blizzards, though, to do a longer harvest season, right? We need that version a little bit earlier and later. Then we had uh, Boreal Beauty, which the largest one was 3.6 grams. Well, you could do this, this one to Japan too, but it doesn't look as big, right? But it's really fatter. So uh, we found this ripe, I found this ripening in early August. But I was so excited, it had everything right about it, except maybe a little point on some of the berries but it kind of looks like a heart, so uh, holds on strongly, holds on stronger than the blizzard. So I think it will be better, and uh, it also tastes great. So that's a year, we were already propagating blizzard uh, earlier, and this one just started getting propagated, so it's gonna be available later. So from, you know, tundra or the indigos and that, we have a longer uh, growing season. Uh, I would say if you have the other Russian varieties, a lot of Russian varieties are coming over here. Sometimes they're renamed, we don't know what, where they come from. But they're going to be uh, competing with the Tundra types. And the other ones are certainly a new breakthrough. Although when Maxine comes out with her stuff, her stuff is probably going to be in, in around this area, uh, harvest season two. So there's uh, extremes of... Uh, large and small. Because actually, berry blue or Czech 17 was the smallest berry in our trial. 
it was the smallest, but it tastes good with sugar. Anyway, there's Russia, I don't know what that's about. Um, I think this might be an earlier version of the talk. A little out of sequence. So we, generally speaking, Haskell, uh, the early ones come in before strawberries, the mid-season. Maxine stuff I, is mostly around strawberry season, but you can also get it after that. Uh, let's see. So here's uh, peak bloom time. So we've been categorizing them by where they, when they're blooming in our area. So we have, it can vary by as much as a month. So this is just, uh, if you're trying it in a more southern location, the uh, difficulty is with the super, the super early bloomers, if you get a really warm spell midwinter, they might wake up and bloom. And this is certainly the case in Oregon. I'm not sure if you guys might be farther north that that might not happen to you. Has anyone had plants bloom in the winter here? So maybe it's, maybe it's not a problem here. Probably maybe southern uh, BC, it might begin to be a problem. Uh, but if it were a problem, you'd be wanting to go for the later blooming types. But then you lose the advantage in the market of having a you know, later season. Uh, when you have gradually warming springs, that's when you get the bloom separating. But when you have like a cold winter and then it warms up quickly, then they all tend to compress. And that, it might not be one month spread out, it might only be two weeks, right? So then it doesn't matter as much. Uh, yeah, so fast warming shortens the bloom. So the first varieties, the two I just mentioned, we're actually studying them a little further to see what would pollinate. If they'll pollinate each other, that will be fine. We know blizzard overlaps with the indigos, but it overlaps not completely. So a fast change in spring, it will work, but other years it might not. So we're, we're working on pollinators for a little bit about planting. Uh, Hascap is naturally found on the edge of wetlands, right? It can survive wet soils, but it prospers in well-drained soils, right? The reason it's spread throughout the boreal forest is uh, nothing else wants to grow there, <laughs> right? So. Uh, I've had, early on, I had farmers say, I've got this horrible land near the river that floods all the time. Uh, what if I put ASCAP there? And I said, well, please do an experiment. I think my last slide of the whole conference, I talked about doing an experiment properly. Just don't throw everything in one area and make your guess. If you're not certain, you should try it two different places or something. Everyone that's done that has come back and said, it does better well-drained. It might be something, you know, if it floods one every 10 years, but not too long, uh, it might be okay. Uh, more about the roots and soils. In Japan, when I visited, uh, I didn't see anyone using chemical fertilizer. It was all compost. But Hokkaido has a lot of uh, horses and, and some animals up there, so that's what they were doing it with. There's Russian papers that say it doesn't really benefit very much from extra nitrogen. Uh, Hascap may be very efficient at nitrogen uptake. For one th reason, it has a shallow root system. Its roots are not far down. So if you sprinkle fertilizer on top, it's all going right away into the plant. Right? There was actually a, a group in Quebec of, I think, extension agents who fertilized Hascap the same amount that they thought a high bush blueberry plant would like, and they killed everything in their collection. Right? Because they didn't realize that blueberries are actually not that efficient at taking up fertilizer. They don't even have root hairs. Right? Hascap has all its roots up at the top, so all that, they were probably getting five times more fertilizer than they should. The other thing is, Hascap tends to grow for like six weeks and then stop. It doesn't need that much more fertilizer the rest of the season. But I also wonder if being in a wetland, uh, 
and sometimes the roots dry out and get a little oxygen, and then it takes things. Maybe it's also very efficient. Maybe it has some chemistry about it. I have actually I have a graduate student who's studying uh, nutrition in Hascap. He just started last year, so he will give us more understanding on this. There are nutrient studies ongoing in Ontario and Saskatchewan that will, uh, ours is just starting this year, uh, but the Ontario one may be finishing up next year. So we'll know a little bit more about that. Uh, Maxine Thompson, her review of literature indicates HASCAP likes a pH 5 to 7, but we have pH almost 8 at the university and it's doing fine there. So really wide range of, of soils, unlike like blueberries, like a lot more acidic. Uh, low temperatures with excess water will reduce yield and uh, it also has some uh, drought resistance. I think the drought resistance comes from the fact that it, it, it's not growing all summer long. You know, it's, it's naturally going to slow down during the heat of summer anyway. So it's one of the first plants to grow in the, sp in the spring and one of the first to stop growing. And Russian literature always recommends fall planting. But I think that's because they're digging the plants out of the ground. They're not buying potted plants. They're not buying plugs, right? And so it, it causes more damage if they did that. If you did it in the springtime and it's trying to grow and you ruined the roots then, uh, that would be a, a hindrance. But if you had, uh, yeah, so if you're going to move it, move it in the fall probably. We plant whenever we have the time. <laughs> We've planted during the heat of July. And sometimes we felt really sorry and put little shade cloths on them. Uh, we also had mud. We plant into mud. And we get bogged down with things. So we plant all the time, and we haven't had uh, too many problems like that. I think the best thing would be if you get dormant plants. You know, if you could put them in the ground as soon as you open them, and they were dormant. Now, some of the companies sell dormant plants and might charge you extra. Uh, others don't. Of course, if you see them growing, then you know they're alive. But if they're dormant, and then something doesn't grow, then you and your propagator will get to argue who killed it. Did they kill it, or did you kill it? And that's one prop thing. When you do get leafed out plants, sometimes they've already been growing in a greenhouse for a month. And they're not going to grow anymore. So they're going to sit there, and that first year you're going to wonder what happened. I had once uh, sold, well, one of our local small greenhouses had bought one variety of hascap, and I said, well, you know you need a pollinator. And he went, you do? And I said, all your customers are going to plant those hascap and not get anything. So I sold them little cuttings, and he actually made a big deal of helping the university, paid $3 for each of these cuttings. Well, he put them in a flower pot, they were like this big. They leafed out and almost every bud broke. And one month later, they were a bush like this that he sold for $25 for one month investment. Right? <laughs> anyway, so I, this is his tape. I'm not going to say who that was. But uh, <laughs> they really do. There's a, there is a big difference. You know, if you were to buy a dormant plant like that and plant in your field versus one with all leaves and it only got that big, that dormant one's going to branch out that first season grow a lot more. Yeah, so five times the cost. So uh, if you bear, I, bet, I bet they weren't well rooted. <laughs> so usually you want to get a plug liner. And it would be better if your plug had, like this is the plug that has like a line going through it so the roots don't wrap around, right? Because a root wrapping around can choke itself a little bit. And there's some square pots. Um, it might be better to get one with a little bit bigger pot. It might uh, grow a lot faster. And I, I haven't really experimented because I'm doing this other sideways thing that's coming up. But you don't, if that really wraps around and grows, it could choke the plant later on. So here's one of my favorite things we've experimented with. Uh, inspired by our clay soil and heavy rain one year, we started out with plugs that were going to be this big going in the field. And by the time uh, it came that we could actually get in the field, they were this big. 
right? On a little tiny plug like this, uh, really weird. So I had some ideas on what to do. Uh, Hascap does not sucker, right? So none of, there's, no, there's no roots coming out over here. Side shoots can form over here, right? Uh, if you plant that, well, this is actually a general slide from other fruit crops. Hascap does not sucker. Uh, but cherries and saskatoons do. If you did plant a suckering one shallowly, it doesn't sucker as fast too much. But if you were to plant like this in midsummer or late summer or fall, it would very easily heave by springtime. And we've done that a few times uh, on our clay soil. Maybe the single trunk is more vulnerable if you planted it like that, but they tend to have multiple branches. More vulnerable if mice came and ate it or something. Uh, if you plant it deeper, it's not going to heave, it's less likely to heave, or if it does, it doesn't matter. Uh, multiple trunks fit really good for our machine, but if you have a certain kind of harvesting machine that wants a narrow row, maybe you don't want to plant it deep. But this is what I did with my big plants. We laid them down sideways in a trench, and I thought, well, I don't even have to cut that, because there's going to be roots forming along here, right? Uh, maybe the, actually it turned out one of the years we did this there was a drought year and all the plants planted sideways looked great because they had more of their mass under the ground so but really we haven't studied these different depths or anything like that we haven't had funding or time to do that but we, that's something to experiment on if you did plant them sideways, you actually get a wider bush, and so your row spacing is probably a little bit different. You know, instead of a meter and a half between plants, a meter and a half to here, but then you skip a, however long that is and go on. This is how we've been planted with a little potato trencher uh, at the university, because we're, we're tending to grow, we have all these different kinds of plants with tags on it, so we don't do, do fast track, and Hamish will show you some fast track methods, but if you just had a little planting, you might get, I think we got this at PV Mark for $125 or something, like really low cost, uh, and it just has a single scoop, and we make a trench, and lay our plants down sideways like that, and then push soil in over the side, and uh, yeah, so there they are in the trench. And then we just water them in. And they, those actually have a little bit of a concave so that they can trap water a bit better. When it grows up, some of them, this one didn't get planted too deep. But a lot of the nursery plants will tend to be kind of floppy growing in the greenhouse. And I would just let the flops go. And they make straight branches after that. So this bush is like, well, I really wish that were under the ground, though be firmer. I wonder if you had a harvesting machine and you went this direction, if it would like pull up the branches too much or something. But it is possible to have a wider bush like that. Okay, so Hascap really have a shallow, wide root system. When we removed one of the fields, we had originally planted one field in plastic, which was like a meter plastic, but then when it gets buried it's two feet. And we found that the roots not only went to the edge of the plastic, they went under the plastic and into the rows. And the bush might have been this big, but it extended almost twice as far as the drip line. Like, would you say that's right, Hamish? Something? I've, I've, I've had roots five feet away from the plants underneath the plastic and out into the field. You can dig down and find them. Yeah, so that sort of gives you a clue on uh, not getting too much herbicide in the middle of your row, <laughs> but shallow roots with more oxygen, and uh, this is just spelling out what I did say, but they don't compete well with grass, right, because grass will fill up that upper zone, so we usually have bare soil on ours the first few years, and when the bush gets close to the size you want, that's when I would put the grass in. Although one of our um, growers was, has been an Experiment. Well, he's not really experimenting because he only did clover. If he had done clover and not clover, we would say he's experimenting. But he's planted clover thinking it will give it extra nitrogen, and it seems to be working, but he didn't do that until the plants were a little older. 
I don't know if it's a good idea first thing. There's how it's growing in the wild, uh, probably in the Maritimes, but uh, the, mo the reindeer moss, and I think these are bear berries, they are not very competitive. They're even more shallow than Hascap, so it's prospering out there. But that's typically of what our fields kind of look like. We cultivate every now and then, and when they're young, we're more, much more particular on uh, hoeing out the weeds that are right next to the plants. 